So I'll be uh, telling you about what we do in my research group. I don't have a uh, $600 million revenue company behind me, but I do have a, a small team of uh, smart and dedicated individuals. And I hope that I'll be able to present something that is exciting, even if we will be changing gears a little bit and moving more into physics and photonics. Um, but I'll try and sort of focus on the big picture rather than the nerdy details. So um, I'll just begin with a brief introduction to light, given that you guys have worked on electronics. And the answer to this question might depend on whether you ask an artist, a technologist or a theorist. But it is a remarkable fact about uh, photonics and optics that it is described by these four coupled vector differential equations known as Maxwell's equations. And they have been known for 150 years or something like that. Um, nevertheless, they are so complicated that they continuously generate surprises and exciting new effects. And I will show you an example of that in my talk. So, from a slightly more nerdy perspective, um, light is uh, electromagnetic waves. And this is what you would typically see in a textbook. And I'm sure most of you in the audience have been through something like this in your electromagnetism course. There's an electric field and a magnetic field. And then you can be characterizing this. It has a propagation direction, the polarization of the electric field, amplitude of the electric field. You can also form more complicated states that don't exactly look like this over here with angular momentum. And then you can also, if you're interested in quantum applications, uh, study the quantum correlations and statistics of the optical field. Uh, so this is sort of moving into quantum technologies, which I will not be talking about today. So um, to generate light, the canonical way of doing that is using an electrical dipole. And in a classical picture, that is basically a charge moving up and down along this dipole axis. And it radiates this uh, donut shaped pattern, which I think you, most of you have also seen in your electromagnetism textbooks. Now, there is something about this picture here and about everything I told you so far. That is, that this is all bulk objects. This all relies on infinitely large materials that you look at far away. And there, this is a correct picture. But what I'll be telling you about is nanophotonics. And that, there's really something entirely different popping up. And one way of illustrating that is to look at the same picture as I just showed you, namely the field radiated from a dipole source along the vertical direction here. So you have your current oscillating back and forth. Actually, let me just get my laser pointer on here. The current is oscillating like this. And you can see this characteristic donut shaped pattern here. The reason for having this black uh, circle here is that the electric field diverges at the point of the emitter. So you need to sort of black it out to normalize it to something. In this case, the brightest features are out here. This is exactly the donut pattern. But if I then choose to make my circle smaller, so I do take a smaller part of the divergence, then I see here that there's some new components coming up. These are so-called near fields and intermediate fields, and they are way stronger when you get to this length scale. So what that means is that this, this is an example of when you look closely at an emitter, it is entirely different from what you would see in undergraduate textbooks. There's really much, much more to the electromagnetism than, than just some plane waves and some waveguides. And, and this is really what excites me a lot about nanophotonics. Um, and it also tells you that if you are able to pattern materials at this uh, very small length scale, you can begin to see entirely new effects. And maybe to translate this into more tangible terms and the wavelength divided by something, the crossover when the near and intermediate fields begin to dominate happens for a telecom photon around 70 nanometers. Okay. So it means that if you are in within 70 nanometers of an emitter, nothing in your undergrad textbooks will work. That will not be the dominant contribution. Okay. So um, that brings me to the outline. Now, you already got the crash course on photonics. Now, I will provide you with the crash course on topology optimization, which is a method for inverse design. I'll talk about how to use this in cavities, a new little invention we made for electronic photonic circuit crossings, and how this may be applied to programmable photonics. So, let's dig into it. First, the platform we are using is, I think, familiar to 
uh, many of you, it's silicon and insulated wafers. And Perfect. what we do is that we pattern these guys by uh, electron beam lithography and etching. And then we combine this with uh, advanced inverse design and turn this into photonic membranes. The first example of such a photonic membrane was published now more than a few decades ago. And you might think, ah, this is old research. And indeed, these photonic crystals are kind of old research. But you will also find that we can do a lot better in terms of fabrication today, and we can build entirely new things. Um, OK, so to give an example of one issue here, so, so sorry, maybe I should go back to say we do one more thing, which is very much in line with the Zero Amp project. We can apply voltages to these uh, between a fixed and suspended region, and this allows applying electrostatic forces that can then elastically and reversibly deform the structures to also enable new functionalities. But then we are facing uh, the first challenge, which is how to suspend these movable parts, because we cannot suspend them by magic forces. We need to attach them somehow. And attaching them, if it's also a waveguide, means optical losses. So um, this can be done in different ways, but this uh, I will be using this as an example of how we uh, use uh, inverse design by topology optimization. So what you see here is a uh, cartoon of a uh, waveguide that is suspended by these little tethers and attached to the frame. So this is the oxide of the box layer, and here the box has been etched away, so we have a suspended membrane. The question is now how to place such tethers without incurring huge losses, because if you just attach them, you will have gigantic reflections, and you need tens or hundreds of them in an integrated device, even if it's a pretty small device. And you cannot, you can really not afford to have 10% loss, uh, which will give you a transmission which will be like 0.9 to the power of 1000 or something like that. That doesn't work. So what we do here is that we ask the computer to consider this as a design domain. And it comes up with this. It just looks so politically correct. It looks like, like a coronavirus, but but uh, that's not intentional. Um, the, uh, what is happening here is that this is a completely emergent design. So we ask the computer to say, maximize the transmission. Here's an input waveguide. We know the optical mode here. Please give us the same mode back on the other side. Please respect that we do need to have mechanical suspension, but then redistribute material in such a way as to maximize the transmission and minimize the reflection. And this process is shown schematically here. Um, so what you do is that you represent the design variable in a pixel grid. You start out with a grayscale image, and then you define your target function. You feed the computer with the, if you like, with the physics, with the underlying differential equations. And then there's uh, a procedure here. And as you can see, it's not completely a linear procedure because it's doing a couple of things. One of them is that it's continuously doing a thresholding because you don't want to end up with a grayscale image. Gray here means an intermediate material between silicon and air that doesn't exist. So we need to force the algorithm in to converge into something that has been properly thresholded so that this is silicon and this is air. And so it's, it's basically an extremely advanced inverse design method. It was uh, pioneered by my close collaborator, Ole Sigmund, and his group at, at DGU. But it has this particularly ideal match with uh, nanolithography, uh, or you could say more generally with subtractive and additive manufacturing, in our case, subtractive. And um, one of the things we can do, which very few people do, is that we can include uh, measure fabrication constraints. In fact, nobody else is really doing that. Um, and that is important because sometimes inverse design just gives you a crazy structure. It looks beautiful but you cannot build it, which is not so, uh, you could say, uh, relevant. So one example of applying this is to build optical cavities. And optical cavities are super important to build optical interconnects to increase light matter interaction for quantum applications and much more. And what we did in this case was that we asked the computer, please maximize what is the uh, called the Purcell factor the a figure of merit that quantifies the strength of the interaction between light and matter. In the center of a silicon slab, you will get a sandbox to play in, which is uh, two wavelengths uh, by two wavelengths. And then 
you figure out how to distribute the material, you need to respect Maxwell's equations. Your target function is in like matter interaction strength. And then the computer came up with this design. And it looks uh, pretty crazy. You can see here, uh, we've made a cutout and plotted the electric field on the facets. And you can see that the, that the electric field, which is seen here in the zoom in, is extremely confined to this eight nanometer bridge. Now, there's uh, some understanding. You can learn a number of things. I don't want to say so much about it, but I do want to stress that this is entirely emergent. We have not asked the computer to make a bow tie, which is what this is in the center that gives more volume. We have not asked the computer to make a, a ring-like structure, which is what is giving the temporal confinement. We had just asked it to maximize the light-man interaction. And uh, this is what it comes up with. So the frequency of merit here is that we get telecom photons with a rather high Q factor given the small size and more volume that is extremely small. This is now a photon packed down to really a tiny fraction of a cubic wavelength. And the light man interaction, interaction strength is enhanced by uh, a factor of 6,000 over a rather large bandwidth, which would allow to modulate this with very high speeds if you wanted to. Um, there's one important thing here that I mentioned already. We are including measured fabrication constraints. So we have measured very carefully what can we do with our nanofabrication, and we fed that into the algorithm. So what that means is that even if this looks crazy, it is realistic by construction. So this is what it looks like when it comes out of the clean room. And indeed, eight nanometers is really absolutely pushing our fabrication to the max. Also because these membranes here in this particular device was 240 nanometers thick. So it's an aspect ratio of 30. Uh, and, and it's uh, fairly challenging to, to realize uh, this device. In, in, uh, but, but, but nevertheless, this is based on known fabrication constraints. So uh, I don't want to say so much about the experiment. I do want to say it is the smallest optical cavity ever made, which is quite important for a lot of these applications I mentioned. Um, it is also the first experimental demonstration of confining light below the diffraction limit. Uh, there used to be a thinking that, ah, you cannot confine light below the diffraction limit in dielectric materials. That is uh, a misunderstanding. There's no such limit, but it was just never demonstrated before, in part because it requires extreme fabrication. Uh, I would just say about this that when we do measure the electric field above the structure, the experiment and theory shows a pretty good account. We can also then move on to other things because if you have a cavity, okay, maybe I should say here's a cavity, that's fine. It scatters light out of the plane. That's good to do physics, but you can never really, I mean, it's not so relevant for any applications. There you're typically in integrated photonics. We want to integrate it with a waveguide. If you, for example, want to do, use this enhanced light man interaction to make a better photo detector, you would need to have this coupled to a waveguide. And in conventional design of cavities, you have some systematic way of doing it. You say, okay, maybe I have rack mirrors and I add more or less or I subtract some layers to get my coupling. But with inverse design, the approach is different. Here we really say we have an input waveguide and an output waveguide. And then we ask the computer to please distribute material in such a way as to give us a high transmission while having a maximum like matter interaction strength at the center. And uh, this is what this structure shows. Uh, here you can see the electric field. You can see what it looks like coming out of the clean room. I do want to stress that some of these features here are actually uh, extremely small. I actually provided a zoom in of some of the smallest features in this design, which is on the next slide. And um, this is now approximately 10 nanometers. And it's really impossible to make a claim about the size because as you can see, even though our SEMs are pretty good, um, the scale bar is pretty crazy and, and it's really hard to make any solid claims. But I think this is ballpark 10. There's some SEM bloom, uh, which is well known, that makes things look a little bit larger than they are, but it's really hard to say. So it's sort of you know ballpark 10 in this device. Uh, again, with a very high aspect ratio, and, and I would say quite nice and a very vertical sidewalls. I would say when you do make such aspect ratios and dimensions, you really need to be careful with also with your etching, because even a one degree sidewall uh, angle means that the holes will end up touching. Um, so you need, to, you need to have much, much better than one degree verticality to, to succeed. So this is more generally um, a vision for 
and then suddenly new research field for saying, okay, what really happens with photonics? What happens with like man interaction when we sort of take the links, length scale we used to, and I would say, okay, because the truth is a lot of nanophotonics, which has been a research field for decades, was really on the hundreds of nanometer scales or several tens of nanometer scales. But moving down below 10, uh, there's really a number of challenges, but also a number of, of opportunities, which I consider uh, pretty much all of it fundamental research. Okay, so it's not something where I'm, I'm going to give XFAP a call and say, let's build it tomorrow. But I think there's some really, really exciting prospects for, for research. So, um, I want to move on from the fundamental research and move on to something that is at least a little bit closer to engineering and which may appeal a little bit more to you guys, but still um, utilizing some of the components So we, we are, that I showed you about inverse design. So I mentioned that we uh, uh, are interested also in integration and nanoelectromechanical systems. And there is this general problem which it's not really a problem if you have a foundry already. If you have a CMOS line, you don't care about this. But if you aim to build a compact sensor or a, for that matter, for fundamental research, you are facing the problem that you typically have chip architectures that can in some general, uh, generic topology be seen as uh, optical connections going east-west and electrical connections going north-south. And if you have uh, a CMOS line with 100 process steps, Okay, sure. You just make multiple uh, vias and metal lines, and, and you have an electric that in, in, in some uh, advanced integrated photonics uh, devices that the, uh, there's a huge overhead of interconnect layers. Um, because with growing chip architectures, also the interconnect uh, architecture becomes really an issue. I think that was actually also already touched upon in some of the previous. But anyway. Um, we thought, okay, why not just etch a trench through the optical waveguide? Because that's, we can do that on both sides. And then we can isolate it, we can have current running through these links here that also work as our uh, suspension tethers. We can see here these suspensions uh, come from a previous generation. They don't have this fancy topology optimized design, but they, uh, and they don't work quite as well, but they work uh, okay. Uh, so the main point here is not this uh, suspension here, but the point is we can have a current flowing here and we can have light going here. So that seems pretty simple, but the difficulty is that it doesn't work because if you cut, if you just etch a trench through your waveguide, you will have gigantic reflections and very low transmission. And, and there's no way you can scale this to any dimension. But what we then did was that we used our toolbox from topology optimization and said to the computer, please, to redistribute silicon and air in such a way as to maximize the transmission while minimizing reflection and respecting that we want an air gap of 100 nanometers here. And the computer came up with this design and uh, this is the optical power flow through it. Uh, here you see the experimental realization uh, where we then uh, do very systematic measurements. So. This is what the transmission as a function of wavelength looks like. I want to stress that this is not just a single shot measurement. This is actually a lot of data on a lot of samples because we do on sample averaging and we also do cutback measurements. So we separate coupling losses from propagation losses. So this is really uh, removing all other sources of transmission loss in the circuit, except from the one we're interested in, namely the one stemming from the couplers. And as you can see, the agreement between theory and experiment is uh, pretty good. Actually, we came up with this idea a while ago, and back then we thought, okay, 100 nanometers, that sounds hard. But in the meantime, we also worked quite a lot on the nanofabrication, and actually now we would say 100 nanometers is very easy. So we were just looking into theory, what happens if you can make smaller gaps down to 20 nanometers, and there you can get transmissions very close to unity. The final part of my talk is on how to apply this to programmable photonics. And, and that is uh, somehow uh, related to this uh, discussion, maybe perhaps not really FPTAs because none, none of this is non-volatile, but nevertheless, it is photonic circuits that can be programmed in different ways. And um, one of the things you need to do that is a directional coupler. And a directional coupler is a device where basically it's two waveguides. You launch light into one of them, 
And then you want to be able to control the interaction strength between them such that you can decide if light goes out one way or the other or in a, a superposition of the two. So our approach to this is to use two uh, parallel waveguides. You can see here what it looks like when you're zooming into it. So you have those two waveguides, you launch light into one of them, and then we're using this uh, nanoelectromechanical architecture, we can change the distance between those uh, two waveguides and thereby change the coupling. Notice here that in this design, you will find those little circuit crossings all over the place. I also want to stress maybe as a fun fact for some application guys out there that this is not a false color image. We painted it with electrons because we took it into the SEM with uh, floating potentials. So just by parking the electron beam on these uh, uh, different uh, parts of the circuit for different amounts of time, they char charge up and then they give a different scattering. So, so, so it's sort of a true color image, if you like, because they were charged to different voltages. Um, but anyway, the, what's nice about this is that the competing technology is thermo-optic tuning. That's the only alternative today in, in silicon photonics. And here we're really talking about orders of magnitude, smaller energy consumption. So that's already quite an interesting uh, thing. But then we can begin uh, integrating this into larger architectures. And here you can see, you know, I, I, uh, I really shouldn't have put on this embarrassing uh, image here, but, but this shows that we are a physics group and uh, our approach to the electrical design is incredibly naive, although we are getting slightly less naive as time is evolving. Anyway, you see four electrical contacts on one ground. Here's some isolation trenches. And then the more interesting part of the circuit is this part. This uh, region here is a zoom in to this part where you can see four directional couplers. So we have four uh, inputs and outputs, and we can then route light as it goes through the circuit. If it comes here, for example, with this voltage, we can decide if it should go there or there. If it comes here, we can decide with the voltage applied here if it should exit there or there. So it's, what this really is, is a two by two programmable app drop for time switch. And um, we have a nice little instrument so we can actually apply voltages in situ in our electron microscopes. You can really see here we are mechanically moving the NEMS. That's quite fun. Um, and uh, you can also uh, See, so I have a little video, it's maybe a little bit boring. Here's the input, and you can see here as the output starts here, but moves over there as we slowly change the voltage. So this is really sort of directly uh, showing the functionality of this device as you change the voltage across it. Um, also, this shows the different combos of applying voltages to the different uh, contacts. Um, all right, so that's what I wanted to present. I uh, have shown you about the nanometer scale photon confinement which is the world's smallest electric cavity. I have also shown uh, that this uh, electronic photonic circuit crossing allows building, for example, a programmable photonic switch where actually all electronics, all photonics and all mechanics is a single lithography step, except from the metallization, I should say, from the big, big contacts, but they're sort of big and trivial. Um, and, and this allows really making these prototypes of, of uh, programmable photonic networks. Uh, so on this line of research, we are really beginning to look into uh, packaging and integration. And uh, since I am speaking to a lot of engineers, uh, many of you might uh, then say, ah, but this is eBeam. And um, I agree that this is eBeam. And I am not fully convinced that there is a sustainable business model behind what we're doing here. But I do believe that uh, it's also about posing some challenges to the engineers um, of actually uh, making something that is uh, as small as the numbers claimed in the technology notes, uh, because as you are probably all aware of, uh, there's nothing three nanometer in a three nanometer uh, chip today. Um, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, thanks. And I hope we can have uh, some lively discussion despite the online interaction. Thank you very much, Sarah. Yeah, so there was, uh, I think we got a couple of questions online. Let's let's see what we have here. I wonder if I can see them. Okay, While you're sorry. looking, I should also remember to acknowledge my team and, and the funding buddies that helped out here, as well as my good collaborators in Beanfox, who was providing the uh, proximity effect correction software. 
So the questions I'm, I'm seeing online are, why is it called an electronic photonic circuit crossing? Did you use any something? <laughs> and then did you use any electronic parameters while doing the inverse design? The answer to the first question is that it was a name we came up with uh, because it's what it does. It allows having, well, maybe it's easier to see actually from an image like this, that you can have, um, you can have electrons going in and, and actuating independently up to apply different voltages here and here. You can directly see the different voltages as the different shadings here while at the same time having waveguides crossing it, right? So, so, so this is a different potential than this, but we have a waveguide crossing it. So, so we can have a contact coming in from here to apply voltages to those two uh, nanoelectric mechanical cone drives, but it allows crossing the photonic circuits. So we felt it was a fitting term because that's sort of what it is. But you could say it does one more thing. It also provides mechanical uh, and therefore actually also thermal isolation. So, so in that sense, it's maybe a little bit uh, more than uh, just an electronic sound circuit crossing. The answer um, to the second question about electrical uh, constraints is that we did not include any of it because we're not interested in fast operation here. Um, we are interested in just demonstrating the concept. It, it's it's not a uh, fast switching uh, device yet. It, it could be. Um, and for that reason, all we care about is transferring the voltage. And if it's a little bit slow, it's okay. Uh, may I just uh, expand on the question, just to understand a bit more? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, I understand that, but while you're doing inverse design, isn't it like, um, uh, isn't, it, isn't it a simple photonic crossing that you want to ma maximize the cross uh, the, the, the light from one left to right without losing any uh, energy from it? So, uh, I, I don't understand what kind of um, electronic parameters that you do while that you use while doing this optimization like how different is it from a simple photonics crossing um well it it, it is a purely optical optimization because the uh, maybe i should go back to this the electrical parts are just these ones out here so so it's sort of the full device that constitutes a crossing <laughs> this part is just an optical link um but what is maybe interesting about it is that actually nothing directly like this exists in the literature. Um, there's very little work that aims to, to do that and, and, and uh, really none with the inverse design, uh, maybe surprisingly. But having said that, it's, you could say it's, it's very much like coupling from a chip to a fiber. And there you may want to do an inverse taper or something like that. Right? It's all about mode matching, and, and, and this is what the inverse design is doing, you could say, indirectly. Mm -hmm. Do you want to ask something? Very quickly, thanks very much sir, for the talk. I think you will be here, but a great talk anyway. This is the Dinesh uh, Congressman. I just wanted you mentioned several times about the computer producing a design. What kind of uh, design tool are you talking about? Is there some deep learning or AI or something in there? Thanks. That's a very uh, good question. This, um, you could say, this family of optimizations that that we call topology optimization is based on gradient descent, and the reason is that if you take uh, deep learning and AI and uh, swarm optimization and genetic algorithms and everything else. None of them have ever been demonstrated to beat a gradient descent algorithm. There's no advantage of it ever demonstrated of any of these algorithms in uh, inverse design. So that's why we don't do it. So it's really just gradient. I, I think maybe, uh, where did I have such slides? Um, you can sort of get a feeling for this, right? That you start out with, with a grayscale image and, and then you do a gradient descent to say in which direction should I change my pixel value to improve my figure of merit or my, my objective function. And then you sort of do that continuously while at the same time also turning up the thresholding so that gradually you force the solution into uh, a 
binary design, which you obviously need for fabrication, right? Because all those grayscale materials here, they don't exist. Okay, we, we take, we take uh, one last quick question from the, from the online participants. And it says, do you think that the topology optimization would still be useful in sim similar telecom waveguides, but with boundary limited feature sizes of 130 to 150 nanometers? So like basically having a, a coarser limit to the fabrication scale. Um, in general, I would say yes. I, I think there can be many situations where you can you design your way around it where you don't need it. But, but in many cases, you, you, I, I think we have not yet seen an example where it cannot at least improve things a little bit. Um, in some cases, it really gives radical improvements. In, and, and what is also exciting about it is that sometimes, um, and maybe the best example is, now you guys are maybe not cavity experts, but, but then trust me when I tell you that, when you, that, that, that photonic nano cavities has been a research field for decades. And when you show people this cavity, they have no clue what's going on, right? They're really surprised and they really think this is crazy. And then you begin to tell them, ah, but you can actually understand that this is a bow tie to, to give the spatial confinement. You have those rings to give temporal confinement. You have these lamella-like structures here, which is to give an anisotropic refractive index. And you have some things here that allows to get the maximum reflection of the edges because the edges are part of the a, a, a computational domain and then you can sort of begin to interpret and you can also i didn't show you but you can then simplify this and go back and say ah so i mean again remember people didn't know until a few years ago that it was even theoretically possible to make dielectric cavities below the diffraction limit but now you can use it and go back and say okay let's simplify this a little bit i don't want to build those crazy lamella structures they may be too hard or maybe too uh, sensitive to fabrication uh, disorder or whatever so you can make sort of topology optimized inspired designs and, and, and uh, we, we, some of my colleagues are working on this where you just say the essential features it would be like a bow tie and some concentric rings and that gives actually very good performance nearly as good as this. So I think it's as much about also using inverse design to devise entirely new architectures, new concepts where, where you say, ah, oh, I didn't think about that. The, um, the crossing here is actually a, uh, similar thing if you start thinking about this what you have here is little uh, dipoles that serve as to scatter light in such a way that they that that they together form a uh, give a, a a parallel wave front and 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 you can sort of begin to interpret this is this is a mode adapter you can sort of begin to understand what the algorithm is doing and and get new ideas for how to design lenses for example out of this so, so I, I think right. it's almost like doing an experiment that you need to interpret not a measurement, but a design and try and understand what it means. Okay. Thank you very much.